Good afternoon. I'm Judy Woodward, the History Coordinator of the Ramsey County Library, and I am delighted to welcome you to part three of our new series with J.B. Anderson, The History of Psychology. Today's topic is Sigmund Freud, The Development of Psycho Psychoanalysis and the Theory of Dreams. J.B. Anderson is an educator, curator, historian, and writer. He is the creator of the popular Presidents series. Today's program is brought to you with the co-sponsorship of the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute of the University of Minnesota and the financial support of the Friends of the Ramsey County Library. We are deeply grateful to both these organizations. And now let me turn things over to our speaker, J.B. Anderson, on the topic Sigmund Freud, the development of psychoanalysis and the theory of dreams. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> we were, uh, last week, uh, we had started defense mechanisms, which I claim to be uh, Freud's greatest accomplishment. And it may be that uh, it's one of the greatest accomplishments in all of psychology before the invention of medications, I guess. So uh, this week, uh, they're, they're in alphabetical order. We made it up to compensation. So let's begin with compensation. This is where you uh, have a tremendous amount of achievement in some area in your life. And uh, it's uh, great that you do that because it helps make up for things you consider to be very worthless in another area of your life. This uh, defense mechanism <clears throat> was um, the product of Alfred Adler, and it's a major theme in Adlerian psychology. This uh, picture here, this photograph is of Alfred Adler. There were three schools of psychology in the city of Vienna. Freud was one, Adler was another, and Viktor Frankl was the third. Uh, Adler called this the inferiority complex. It's one of the most recognizable concepts in psychology. People uh, know all about inferiority, even if they've never heard of Adler. <clears throat> and uh, Adler says, uh, basically what's happened is we, um, we start out life totally dependent. I mean, we can't move much. Uh, we can't feed ourselves. We can't speak. Uh, we're totally dependent on other people, uh, basically unable to do anything. And uh, that... Uh, those feelings that we develop as a child uh, about not being as tall as everybody else uh, uh, and not being able to walk uh, for a while, et cetera, speaking. Uh, we have to deal with those feelings that we developed of inferiority during our very early childhood for the rest of our lives. So we do it by covering up weaknesses that we have in our lives. Uh, there are things that um, we, we just don't want to do, like, uh, hey, I, you want to play cribbage? No, I never want a game of cribbage. We hide our inadequacies by uh, not doing them. Uh, but we might be superior at something else. Want to try horseshoes instead of cribbage? So we cover up our, our inadequacies. Uh, your family life may not be so great. Uh, and by poor, I don't mean economically. It might be socially lacking in, in your family. But you go to work. And things are great there. People love you. You do a super great job. <clears throat> uh, compensation can also be negative. This is called overcompensation. Here's uh, Lyndon Johnson talking with an aide. Uh, as a matter of fact, later on, this uh, 
man that's standing here with Johnson, Johnson nominated for the Supreme Court, but he was not approved. But you can see uh, Johnson is uh, showing his strength, does it by standing too close to somebody else. They have to lean backwards as he's leaning forwards. Social distancing is not uh, recognized by Johnson here when he does this sort of thing. And uh, uh, he's, uh, he's really overpowering other people, overcompensating. Uh, midlife crisis is uh, another example. Here's a cartoon. I don't care if people call it a midlife crisis. I'm glad I got this fancy new car. So uh, midlife, we start to lose energy in many cases. Uh, we're, we, we can't maintain ourselves to do certain things like we used to. So uh, frequently we strike out at others, get angry. <clears throat> this is called undercompensation. And it's a fear about other people and other people who are in our lives. It's a feeling we get that's on the downside. It's sinking. And uh, we, we are oftentimes asking for help. Hey, can you help me with this? Uh, hey, can you get this undone? Can, can, something's wrong with my computer. So uh, you demand help from others. Uh, it's the origin of narcissism. We've heard a lot about that uh, in the last few years. Uh, you're weak. You know nothing. Uh, here's an image of a little guy standing in front of a mirror, and he fills the mirror and is crowned king. So you, what you need to do, since you're weak and don't know much, is you need to impress people. You need to show them how great you are. And you talk about how great you are on a regular basis. Uh, the stance that you take uh, indicates greatness even. Uh, you speak highly of yourself. Um, you associate only with uh, people that are of substance, uh, people that are high ranking or wealthy. Uh, and uh, speak a great deal about consumption. Here's what I, I had this uh, ribeye steak for dinner. Uh, I, my entire living room is uh, uh, all gold colored. The, the pillars all have uh, gold overlay on them, et cetera. How you have to always having to tell people how wonderful your situation is. Next offense mechanism is denial. Uh, first, we're going to define it. Uh, let's take a look at the cartoon. It's not denial. I'm just very selective about the reality I accept. So denial, it's a refusal to accept what is actually happening around you, what you actually see around you what you're aware of around you, uh, events that you don't like, you just don't see them. It's a blocking activity. Uh, this uh, uh, comes from Freud's daughter, Anna Freud, pictured here uh, as a young woman and uh, in midlife. Uh, so she's the creator of this uh, concept in defense mechanisms called denial. Uh, cigarette, cigar, pipe smokers, tobacco chewers. Uh, there used to be a lot of people, about 40% in our society in the United States that uh, uh, used tobacco in one of the forms mentioned here. Uh, during the period that tobacco was being criticized and research was coming out about the harmful effects of it, people would argue against the research. Shows, uh, it doesn't really show harm about tobacco, uh, it's all fake stuff. 
Uh, we've heard these same arguments about uh, COVID vaccine over the last couple of years from a great portion of society. I had a brother who was a three pack smoker a day and he used to always say, uh, the only problem with smoking and people not liking the smell of it and stuff is that these companies and buildings and homes, they just don't change their furnace filters often enough. Um, so you find some reason to proclaim why the smoke isn't harmful to you or to others. So addictions are uh, probably the most common known uh, reason for people practicing this denial. Uh, they're just plain saying, this is not a problem. And it's uh, my behavior that you're seeing, that's not the problem. You're making it into the problem. Uh, common phrase, he is in denial. Uh, it's easily recognized by the uh, population generally. Frequently, we hear this phrase about denial and people being in denial and people perceiving that in others. Uh, so you're refusing to deal with something. You're protecting your ego, that is your concept of yourself, the I, capital I letter that you feel. Uh, we avoid anxiety by uh, practicing these defense mechanisms. So it's uh, denial in particular is a great way to subvert uh, pain that you're having, pain that you don't want to face, uh, and consequently avoiding the anxiety of it. Denial is not just a river in Africa. See the map. It's also a defense mechanism. Uh, displacement. <clears throat> uh, you're having a problem someplace. You go to another place and get angry with somebody in that place or it may not be a person. You might break a chair, something like that. Source of the problem is left alone and you take out the difficulty you're having on something else or someone else. Uh, this isn't our topic, but an octave displacement in music, displacement. Your boss yells at you at work. You go home and uh, you cause problems with your spouse. You yell at her. You say, oh, why isn't dinner ready? Something. Uh, you take it out on something else. You got to release the anger you're feeling, but you can't do it to someone who's in charge of you at work. So you might do it at home uh, with your spouse. And then your spouse practices the same displacement. She goes into the backyard and kicks a squirrel. Displacement, taking our anger out on something other than the source. Uh, I mentioned a chair, any object will do. For children, it's often throwing things and it's usually a toy that they have, in particular, a stuffed animal and they'll do something to the stuffed animal, pull its ears or throw it on the ground. Uh, oftentimes this aggression, uh, as I pointed out, like you do it to a squirrel or you do it to somebody at home, it's done to some person who's less threatening to you. They can't get back at you, just like you couldn't get back at your boss at work, for instance. Uh, and aggression is cyclical. It's, has a, it's a circle, moves to different people. You don't always take it out on the same person. 
it frequently moves to different objects. You don't always take it out on the same thing. Next, emotional insulation. Uh, this is isolation, emotional insulation. You take things you're feeling and you hold them inside or you take yourself someplace private. You detach yourself from previous harm. Uh, somebody calls you, hey, we're having a party on Saturday. Come on over, it's gonna start at eight o'clock. Uh, will Harold be there? Yes, oh, uh, well, actually I can't make it. Uh, it's cause uh, actually you don't have another appointment. You don't like Harold. Uh, so apathy sets in about certain events, such as a party where someone you don't like uh, or who you perceive as difficult uh, will be in attendance there. Uh, you avoid things that will be negative to you, cause negative feelings. Uh, previous hurt often leads to a lack of involvement. Um, you're just, uh, it, it might be romance. Your heart is broken, ripped in two as in the diagram here. So you, um, you go, I just don't want to get involved like that again. You become indifferent to certain situations, to certain experiences. Some woman comes over and starts talking to you and you find a way to avoid the conversation because you had a broken romance two years ago. Uh, so it's detachment, it's avoiding hurt, uh, it's experiences that remind you of that past difficulty that you avoid. Uh, just a break here for a cartoon. I don't know where the eggs come from and I have no idea why I feel a compulsion to hide them. And here's uh, Freud treating a rabbit uh, and we have Easter coming up. So it fits the season. Next defense mechanism is fantasy. I don't like my life. Things are so ordinary. That is there ever anything interesting that's gonna happen? You're bored. Uh, mundane is a word often used, lack of excitement. So to make up for these lacks of excitement, uh, you create fantasies. Uh, this is often done through daydreaming. It adds excitement to your life. Uh, let's go swing on a star, carry moonbeams home in a jar. Uh, you sing songs that have uh, interesting, heart-lifting kinds of images with them. You, uh, some of the daydreams you might have, lottery, saving somebody from a bad situation, uh, uh, pulling them back up onto the curb when a car is heading toward them uh, and you're walking around downtown. Uh, you do things that get other people interested in you. And then you celebrate these adventures, even though you've made them up in a daydream. Uh, so it's an imagined accomplishment. Oh, I need to lose weight. Oh, look at me. I, I think I am losing weight. Look in the mirror there. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm definitely uh, on the downside now. And what you're really seeing is something you made up. I'm not that, I'm, I'm, I'm not that big. Uh, it's wish fulfillment is another term that's used for uh, how we deal with emotional insulation. And wish fulfillment is, gee, I wish I was. It's hope for something else. Uh, can be both positive and negative. Uh, 
some uh, daydreams can often be and fantasies can often be negative, not just positive things that make you feel better. Uh, you might uh, create unrealistic expectations for yourself that make you feel uh, inferior. Uh, you might start thinking that uh, fantasies you're having are the reality. And you go to a party and there's a woman, uh, you're a man, there's a woman at the party and you've had fantasies about dating her and you go over and start talking and she's going, who the heck is this guy? Uh, so you lose touch with reality. You think your daydreams are reality. And the fact is they aren't. Uh, positive aspects of uh, emotional insulation and having fantasies or daydreams is um, uh, frequently uh, uh, people that daydream, uh, they almost always are thinking about real life situations. And when they then get into that situation, they're able to meet it because they've daydreamed about possible responses to what if this happens? Here's how I should respond. Well, wait, I could also respond in this way. What can I do to correct it? Um, and uh, people that have these sorts of fantasies actually uh, do very well, uh, better than people that don't have them even uh, in resolving real life situations because They've thought about it and a variety of possibilities for it uh, in advance. Uh, James Thurber pictured here was a famous cartoonist uh, back in the 1930s and 40s. He's the guy that created Walter Mitty and there's a cartoon representation of Mitty in the lower left. And he started these <clears throat> Walter Mitty cartoons and stories in 1939. And uh, Thurber outlines Mitty as a daydreamer. He's, uh, he's all the time thinking about what life would be like in a different situation. So he's meek and mild in real life, uh, real uh, laid back, but has this incredible secret life. The uh, the simplicity of the drawings, especially the face of Mitty here, are a result of uh, Thurber being nearly blind. So um, many of his uh, cartoons are, are uh, very uh, simple drawings and he would have to lay his face very close to the page he was drawing on. But um, this, is, uh, uh, this is probably, the great, one of the great examples from earlier in uh, the last century uh, about emotional insulation, daydreaming in particular, fantasizing about uh, who you are, what you are, what you hope other people think of you. Um, George Eamon Vailant, uh, did research on defense mechanisms. And uh, he concluded that emotional insulation is the primary thing that narcissists engage in. Uh, they're, they fantasize about themselves constantly. Uh, and the fantasies uh, show how great they are. Uh, Close friendships are usually lacking in these individuals that uh, use emotional insulation, that are narcissists, uh, people who use fantasy. They really don't have friends. They may get together with people regularly, so on, but they're always questioning about this person and what should I do? And, uh, I gotta protect myself here. Next defense mechanism is humor. Humor, it's a, 
we all have tension, we all have stress, we all have to cope with it. Humor is the way we do this. This was a giant uh, defense mechanism in my family, still is to this day. Uh, we are constantly uh, saying things to each other that everybody laughs at. Uh, humor is a good tension reliever. So you get a lot of tension, the rope's about to break, uh, somebody says something funny about the situation and the rope becomes strong and active again. Everybody's had a laugh, there's some release. Uh, it doesn't just relieve the person who's, who needs this defense mechanism, but uh, uh, laughter uh, is, uh, a, it's a good thing, a lift, uplifting kind of thing for the whole crowd. Uh, everybody bears off burdens, but in particular, the person who uses humor uh, Freud uh, did not have good comments about humor. He said, you're really hiding a lot of stuff. I, uh, I'm in trouble on that one. Uh, generally, it's uh, really a great uh, uh, mechanism for coping with stress and tension, but uh, because the jokes are funny and there's a lot of release once they're told or once something humorous is said about the situation, off the cuff, doesn't have to be some memorized joke. Uh, often it's something about another person, but it can be very negative also. Next, identification. Uh, Freud said there's three kinds of identification. Uh, as a defense mechanism. There's primary identification, narcissistic identification, and partial identification. We're gonna take a look at all three of these. First, primary. Uh, this is some object of great importance. Uh, you might have a stuffed animal of some kind and you're just incredibly attached to it as a child. And your parents take you to a zoo and they show you that animal in real life. And it's quite exciting. Uh, so it's an attachment to an object, but it can be an attachment uh, to a person also, such as this mother and child uh, drawing, uh, your dear old mom. Uh, but the attachment can come in other ways also. Uh, it can be uh, buildings. Uh, oh, it's a 30 story building. I work in that building. It's, uh, I, and you just identify very strongly with the fact that you work for a company that's in a big building. Or I, I, I live right near 3M. I've had neighbors who work at 3M and uh, uh, you know, you get to talking and they want to talk about what they're doing there. I'm on the 10th floor of the head shed. Uh, that's the main building, which is like, uh, you know, 14 floors. And as you move up in the floors at 3M, you're getting higher up. So there's lots of attachment to the, um, uh, to the building. It might be a home, you know. I have a 3,500 square foot home. Uh, you like to tell people that because most people have 2,000 feet or less. Uh, when I was a child, there, were, there was a magazine that was about movie stars. I, I can't remember if it came out weekly or monthly. Lots of people in the neighborhood would read that, develop attachments to movie stars. Uh, then TV came along and it, it began to happen with TV. You're identifying with something in your environment that fulfills uh, feelings that you want to have. Uh, narcissistic uh, identification. Uh, you, this is a sense of loss. You're a person, but you don't feel like a person or you've lost a friend, 
or you can no longer play with the stuffed animal that you had as a child. Uh, this uh, often begins at a young age. Uh, you might be told it's time to be rid of the teddy bear or something like that. Uh, you need to be defending yourself all the time because you've got this huge sense of loss. So you keep showing people how great you really are. You talk about how great you are. Uh, the fact is, uh, you, you really don't know if you're a person or not. Partial identification. Uh, this, uh, this is where you see, you see another person and you see this person as, hey, they're better than me. Look at the qualities they have and the successes they have. And man, who does that person think they are? Uh, I, I, I should be like that person. I am that person. I need to start talking like that. Uh, and pretty soon, this person who's your rival becomes somebody that you try to uh, become like. Basic level is, in identification is you make an attachment to another person. It can be a mother, it can be a movie star, it can, it can be a friend, uh, anything, uh, anything like that. Uh, you, you, uh, you become a part of something else other than yourself. And anything that gets in the way of that identification, you see as critical and something that needs to be uh, criticized. It's a rival. Uh, intellectualization is the next defense mechanism. Uh, got a lot of stress. How can you avoid it? How can I get out of this situation? Uh, and there's, there, it might be the result of certain items and uh, you think about it. Uh, and oftentimes you just go, okay, I'm going to avoid thinking about it. Uh, I got to just stop thinking about these things. Uh, so you list the things that um, are causing stress and then, okay, stop thinking about it. Uh, you find rational reasons. Uh, it's language. You put it into different uh, words, what it is that's bothering you. You, you make it sound uh, high on the scale of thinking. Uh, it helps you define the situation. And so what you call it becomes important and you don't call it something negative or not even necessarily something positive, but you call it something that sounds like a great piece of thinking. Uh, you might get fired from your job. Ah, it was a business decision. Uh, they didn't fire me. Uh, they just, uh, th that whole area uh, just wasn't doing the business it needed to. And so they needed to get rid of people. Uh, and, uh, you, know, you know, their job is to maintain the company. This is nothing personal. Negative side is you find uh, some sort of rational reason for a very dark event, such as getting fired. Uh, introjection is our next defense mechanism. Uh, people you like, you love listening to them. They say things and you, you accept things that they say. You go, boy, this person is really great. And um, well, that, that didn't sound so great, but I think this is what she meant. Uh, usually it's a person of authority, uh, uh, like someone at work 
or when you're a kid, it can be a parent, or when you start having love interests, it can be someone who you really like, it, uh, romantically speaking. Um, this introjection has been described as being very similar to identification. Here's a person I really like, they can't do anything wrong. Uh, identification is here's a person I really like, I'm going to be as they are. Uh, your dad tells you boys don't cry. You're learning a lesson. And you need to take that in. Now, your dad's somebody important to you. You want to be, you're growing up, you want to be a male adult. You got to listen to this kind of stuff. Passive aggressive is our next defense mechanism. This is um, protecting yourself against harm that's coming in your direction, uh, but you do it in a passive way. Uh, so it's an indirect behavior. You don't shout it out to people or carry it out by removing yourself physically from a situation but you can, uh, you reject stuff that other people say, do, ask of you. Uh, so it's, it's not doing something that someone expects you to do. It's being passive aggressive. Instead of saying, no, I'm not gonna do that. I think that's foolishness. You just step aside and don't get involved. And they go, what, what's with that guy? What's wrong with him? How come he, boy, he sure isn't interested. Uh, it's generally known as procrastination. Not doing a requested job. Uh, illustrated here by a donkey that's not going to do what you want it to do. Uh, it's frequently called stubbornness. Uh, we're walking down to the grocery store. You're sitting on the stairs. Uh, outdoors, up to the front door. How come you're not coming with us? Well, maybe you don't like somebody at the grocery store, but you just, I'm not going. And walk the, the other two people walk away, head to the grocery store. Boy, is that guy stubborn. Stubbornness, often displayed by closing off other people like this. Mouth is shut. Uh, pursed in even, arms are crossed, you're closing off other people. Uh, it's like the old story of the ostrich with its head in the sand. Boy, that guy's got his head in the sand. He doesn't want to do anything. Uh, so you avoid, it's avoiding the request of another person or another group of people. You don't tell them no, but you don't get involved. So it's what's called a silent evasion because you see what's being requested of you as a difficulty. It's a problem, but I, I can't say out loud, I'm not gonna do it. Then we're gonna get involved in an argument, a conversation, something they're gonna convince me I should. So I, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna do nothing about it. I'm gonna avoid it. Uh, it's a way to avoid people. It's uh, a way of, uh, you've got an excuse for not doing something, but it's an excuse. And the excuse is, I'm just gonna shy away from it. Uh, you're not giving a verbal excuse. Uh, although sometimes, if this becomes open, you will respond with sarcasm. Or somebody might say, as this woman is doing, she's got her fingers up for the quote marks, you know, nice job. Doesn't mean, it really means you screwed that one up. Passive aggressive person. Uh, often uh, what they're doing is really hiding their 
lack of interest in what's going on, and they do it by remaining silent. And they hide the anger that they're really feeling toward the person that's making the request. It's a fake smile as portrayed here. Projection is the next defense mechanism that we'll talk about. Uh, this is where you've got a negative felt feeling, uh, but you place it on another person. That's not, okay, I, this is miserable, but it's that person over there that did it. Uh, it's something you don't like in yourself, but you put it on another person. You blame them. It, be, it does not become your fault. It becomes their fault. A cheating spouse. You suspect your partner is cheating. You're the cheater. And then you, you go, well, she or he is doing it too. So, okay. Uh, I don't know. Uh, in, in other words, you're taking something you're doing and you figure that's what everybody's doing. Anyway, you project it onto other people. Uh, we see a lot of political accusations uh, aimed at someone, people in politics. I often think they just accuse so-and-so of doing this and such. Fact is, they're the ones that are doing that. There's four steps you can take if you're being projected onto, someone is projecting their difficulty onto you. Number one, say, uh, this person's definitely projecting on me, recognize it. Uh, when they use the word you, uh, that's a big hint that the projection is going on. Have you gained weight? They're really worried about themselves gaining weight. Uh, where's the other person coming from? Uh, think to yourself, they're trying to get rid of something. They're asking me, have you gained weight? And they're concerned about that themselves. So they've just told me something about themselves. They, their question, is not at asking about me, it's asking about them. Cast off the projection, it's not a problem for you. So you let it go, like casting off this ship or cast off as in knitting. So uh, just uh, cast it off, it's not about you. Uh, so you accept that uh, this is about them. I'm not going to let this get in the way of me. They're trying to influence me. Uh, reaction formation is our next defense mechanism. This is... Uh, these are feelings that we have. They're desires that we have. And they're usually unacceptable feelings, might be uh, feelings for a great deal of money and how you can get it. They're desires that we're having. They might be uh, sexual, they might be food oriented. Uh, frequently, these are things that are illegal. So some group of people have said, hey, we should make this kind of thing illegal. We don't allow it to happen. And uh, uh, you know that it's unacceptable, might even be illegal, immoral. But um, hmm, what can we do about it? Well, you try to convince yourself that it's socially acceptable uh, 
or it's socially unacceptable feelings, but uh, you're doing it anyway, so you keep it to yourself. You convince yourself that, uh, uh, well, I need to be thinking this stuff. Shakespeare's play Hamlet, the lady doth protest too much. It's uh, these protests that you hear being voiced by a person are in reality attempts to hide the feelings. Uh, they're getting something out, but they want to talk more about what's going on. And uh, other people go, uh, this should be a decent person. Uh, instead, they're just constantly talking negativity. Uh, exaggerated expressions are a uh, frequent indication of reaction formation, reaction to something. Uh, you know, laughing out loud can be one. A huge open mouthed grin, sticking your tongue out, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, person with an unwanted child talks about how horrible things might be. They take an opposite stance. Uh, it might be fat versus thin. It might be a kid's 10 year, I've seen this. I mean, a kid's 10 years old. I wish this kid had get grown up and out of the house. Uh, the unwanted child, you're, you're causing reactions in someone else. Reaction formation was uh, first described by Anna Freud, Sigmund's daughter. Next, rationalization. Uh, again, uh, this is a way to uh, take behaviors that we engage in and say that they're okay by giving good reasons for them, rational reasons. Uh, a lot of people look at somebody uh, in reaction formation who's explaining something and they go, they're making excuses. You know, they'll walk away and say to another person, boy, they sure are making excuses for themselves. Reaction formation. She turned me down for a date, but hey, I wasn't really interested in her anyway. I mean, I was feeling sorry for her. I thought, uh, you know, might give her a little upbeat. Uh, some some guy asked her out. So anyhow, I'm, I'm thankful she said no. Uh, you do poorly on a test. Well, the guy that wrote the test that doesn't know how to write a question. Uh, you can't even understand these many of these things. He, he leaves words out. Uh, the sentences are incomplete. Uh, re, uh, rationalization uh, protects you. The concept you have of yourself, uh, the feelings that you have, high or low of yourself, uh, I, I need to protect my self-esteem. Uh, this is not my problem. This is somebody else's problem. And, and, and here's a perfectly good reason why. So uh, things that you achieve, you did that on your own. Things you didn't achieve, failures, somebody else did that to you. And there's a reason for it. Next defense mechanism is regression. Uh, regression is um, uh, you go backwards. Uh, in terms of aging, it means you go back to an earlier age uh, or an earlier stage of development that you were in. Uh, you retreat. Um, you might have had a place 
in your earlier life and you felt safe, secure, and happy. If only we could go back, if only we could go back to that place where we, when we lived in Cincinnati, you know, something like that. So it's a retreat to an earlier stage of development. You regress, you go back. Um, some conflict arises, uh, some danger presents itself, and you go back to an earlier age where you perceive you didn't have those kinds of problems. I spill something on the kitchen floor. I used to take a sponge, bend over and wipe it up. Now I got paper towels. I throw them on the floor and I wipe it up with my feet and leave the paper towel there for the next time I spill something. Can't bend over anymore. Or you might remember when you were able to dance. I could lift my left leg up to my right shoulder and now I can't even stand on one leg. Uh, you get married and you're trying to establish a home, uh, but uh, you came from a home that was established and you're still not super secure in this new relationship, this new home, it may become something someday, a great attachment to the place, the person, etc. But I got to go back and visit mom and dad and the old house and feel more secure there. It's a regression. You're also getting ideas about, uh, okay, I, I need to do this now for my new situation. Uh, frequently older children will get stressed. You'll come upon them, they're sucking their thumb. Uh, and you might say, hey, uh, you don't need to suck your thumb anymore. Uh, little babies suck their thumbs, but this is a regressive thing seen in most children. Uh, they get to be way beyond the suckling age, but there's still great comfort in sucking on the thumb. Another Anna Freud defense mechanism, adding to her father's list. Oh, next, repression. Uh, you got, you got some uh, unpleasant things in your life. It might just be thoughts. Other people don't know about it. It's internalized, it's you alone. Uh, but it might be an action and other people saw it. And uh, you, it's something you did publicly. So you wanna be rid of it. Uh, at the personal level or at the public level. And to try to be rid of it, what do you do? You push it into the unconscious mind. You place it someplace where you hope it will be forgotten. And it helps you get rid of the anxiety of those thoughts, those actions. You repress it. Uh, an older person was abused as a child. So you just, you forget those memories. Uh, thankfully you're out of the house now and uh, okay, it's over, forget about it. Uh, I'm on a new track now. I got new relationships, uh, however difficult they are, uh, they're not as bad as the ones I've moved away from. Repress. Uh, there are physical symptoms for people who uh, use repression uh, to a great extent. They overly repress something. Uh, we can see uh, increased heart rate as 
what's common. And that's due to the stress of, uh, hey, I'm forgetting this stuff. Next is sublimination. Uh, are we accepted by our friends or by people that we don't know? We go to a party, there's people there that are new to us. Um, what do they think? Uh, uh, are they gonna let me in? Uh, am I socially acceptable? Uh, you might have notions within yourself that you're not socially acceptable. Uh, but you want to display behaviors that are socially acceptable. So you're constantly questioning uh, what's going on with me in a social situation. Uh, physical activity is uh, frequently used to show uh, acceptable behavior. Um, you start talking to people about things you do. I play car, usually it's hobbies. Uh, yeah, I, uh, uh, I play cards a lot. Uh, you're showing that you're using your leisure time constructively. And uh, uh, you're constantly giving to people notions that they think are great we frequently say it's concrete, you know, this is really something hard and fast and good. So you deflect away things that are questionable. You talk about in social set settings, things that are acceptable. Uh, I worked with a guy that all he could ever talk about was raising his two children and how wonderful it was and how this problem arose and we got it resolved. And, and uh, so you're uh, constantly talking about things that get resolved, things that are wonderful that you're doing right. And uh, you don't talk about, but rather subliminate the things that are negative because there's always negative and positive. So you redirect uh, these negative impulses into what appear to other people to be very mature actions, very appropriate actions. You show yourself to be someone that is uh, just startlingly good, you know? uh, whereas everybody has difficulties and problems. Uh, next is suppression. Uh, you're going to deliberately forget about something because it created a great deal of stress, negativity, anxiety. Uh, we got to get rid of this, cover it up, push it underground. Uh, this is something that uh, we shouldn't have to deal with. And thankfully, we don't have to because we can use suppression. Uh, problem with suppression as a defense mechanism is these, uh, these notions that we don't like that create our stress and anxiety pop up again. It's difficult to stop thinking about them. They're haunting. They keep coming back. Uh, most, many psychologists say, this is probably the most common defense mechanism where it's right up there with a couple others. Uh, we just can't get rid of uh, things we don't like. Most common uh, suppressions deal with grief, uh, the death of someone close to us. They deal with frustration, the inability to change yourself or someone else, uh, and anger. Uh, they're just a constant state of thinking about uh, 
why didn't I do this? Why didn't I do that? Uh, why didn't uh, he or she do this or do that? So suppression, uh, trying to forget something difficult uh, comes with uh, grief, comes with things that frustrate us and with things that make us angry. Uh, the worst consequence of suppressing items is uh, a physical characteristic again, and it is high blood pressure. Uh, you bottle it up, you sweep it under the carpet, you try to forget it, you hide it. Uh, these are uh, common phrases here uh, uh, about someone who's practicing suppression. I'm just going to sweep that under the rug. Yep. Or you bottle it up. You do more and bottle it up. You put a cap on it, too. Undoing. Uh, this is where you do something, but then you feel guilty about it afterwards. So like a, it's a ball and chain around your neck, and you're dragging it around. And uh, you're constantly wondering, why in the world did I do that? Why did I say that? Uh, or why didn't I do something? Uh, so lots of negative feelings enter. And this should be undoing. I'm sorry, my title looks across the top there. I didn't get, get it changed from suppression. This is undoing. Uh, you have negative feelings about somebody else, might be a pal, the guy next door. Uh, you meet them and you act nice, but uh, geez, how can I avoid this guy? He lives next door. I really don't like him, but you're supposed to be nice. Um, you cancel, you try to cancel out uh, previous negative feelings, you undo them. You alter your past uh, is another thing that you try to do. I did that, but I didn't like doing it and I'm not gonna do it again. And uh, we're just gonna forget about it. You're undoing it. <coughs> Those are the defense mechanisms. Uh, very important uh, aspect of uh, Freudian psychology. The next thing we're gonna talk about, uh, Freud called drives. So let's take a look at drives. First, the introduction. Uh, there's about, we've had 230 slides so far, roughly on Sigmund Freud. Uh, and uh, this is one of the drives we're gonna talk about here is sex. I have mentioned it earlier, but um, the point I wanna make here is there's a whole lot more to Freudian psychology than, uh, than the sexual drive. Uh, and this is the drive everybody knows about and associates with Freud. Uh, let's start by defining drives. Well, are they instincts? This really depends on where you come down. You know, if you majored in biology, you kind of think there's lots of things that can't be explained. If you majored in the social sciences, you think uh, uh, these are things people can overcome. If, uh, if the sex drive is an instinct, how come there's uh, priests and nuns who never have sex throughout their entire lives, or Buddhist monks. Uh, an instinct is something that we're born with. We can't avoid it. It's biological in nature. Uh, an instinct is not a drive. A drive is something that's psychological, uh, it varies, can vary from culture to culture. It's learned. Uh, so in the social sciences, people tend to come down 
most strongly on the uh, cultural psychological side uh, uh, and call it a drive, not an instinct. It's not born in. Uh, one of the things that uh, is not explained uh, that a lot of people think is an instinct is sucking. You never had to teach a little baby to suck, but they're born and they know how to get the food. Uh, so a drive, uh, another way to say it is it's a motivation. Uh, motivations consist of actively doing something frequently. It might be reading. It might be exercising. Uh, and generally, with a drive, we, we say a lot of people, boy, they're really driven to, to boxing, or they're really driven to learning stuff. We talk about it as a drive, something that they're doing, other people aren't doing, so it can't be an instinct. Let's take a look at the types of drives. There's, uh, Freud said, there's a life drive and there's a death drive. Life drive first. This is also known as the libido. It's also known as eros. And this is the sex drive, frequently called the pleasure principle. And it's how we bring new people into the world. So the life drive is primarily a sex drive driven by pleasure, or what Freud called the pleasure principle. Uh, the survival of the species is what's at stake here. Uh, it's about pleasure and it's about reproduction. Uh, now, however, with overpopulation, uh, we need to be looking at, is reproduction a difficulty? We're now pushing 8 billion people on the planet, can't support that many people. Uh, as a result of all those people, we're pushing out into the atmosphere lots of chemicals that uh, are not liked. So reproduction, may lead to the extinction of the species. The earth can only handle so many people. So the life drive has come into question. It, it uh, may be a drive, if it's just a drive and not an instinct, we can overcome it, but will we? So it's about more than uh, sex alone. It's about basic uh, needs that we all have. We all need to have food. We want to eat something, at least one meal a day. Uh, we've gotten into the habit of three meals a day. Many doctors say you're better off eating five smaller meals a day. Uh, and we want to avoid pain. We want life to be comfortable. We want to avoid psychological pain, physical pain. So we need food drink, and avoidance of pain. Those are part of the life drive. Then there's uh, cooperating with other people. We're a social species. We want to love others, uh, but we also have a very strong uh, hatred toward others. There are many people that just can't understand anyone that's different from them physically, emotionally, or with beliefs. But uh, love and cooperation are the primary driving forces of life, according to uh, Freud. You wanna feel comfortable, you wanna be happy. Uh, again, this is part of the pleasure principle. Uh, let's watch a movie. Okay, but it's gotta be a comedy, you know. Uh, we feel more comfortable with that, maybe. Uh, it'll make us happier. 
the death drive. Uh, it's also known as the death wish. And this is about life ending. How do we react to the reality of the end of life when we're alive and living, yet we see death all around us? Uh, often we react by being aggressive. Uh, and it's not just person to person. It's group to group. There, are en there have been endless wars in our history. Uh, these are physical attacks. On the more social level, it's just, it's verbal attacks. We're angry. We withdraw, try to forget about certain things that are gonna happen, such as the death drive. Some societies express this through uh, a whole bunch of different ways. Uh, a gun culture is one of those ways. Uh, lots of Freud patients were World War I soldiers the last 20 years of Freud's life. They had near-death experiences. Uh, they now uh, have dreams uh, that repeat themselves about people dying and violent deaths and being hurt themselves. And many regularly will talk about the war and the experiences of war. Others, just the opposite. They can't talk about it. They can't let it out. World War I soldiers were dealing with death. They saw it all around them. Uh, now, the sex drive has been a giant drive. And from the 1800s and all through the Victorian age and up to the 1960s, societies, according to Freud, were really focused on the sex drive, but he said that'll change. Death will take over and be a greater concern. In the 1960s, universities uh, started having courses on death. Columbia University started with uh, 30 students in a class on death, and within a couple of years, there were 300 students taking the class. In the 1960s, death became of great interest as sex had been for the last 150 years. Uh, books were being published about death. The American Way of Death by Jessica Mitford. I remember reading that book when I was in college and uh, a lot of it was dealt with death and thinking about death, but a lot of it also dealt with the funeral industry. And then uh, Clifford Bryant, uh, Brian's book, Handbook of Death and Dying, was another big seller. So these two drives are cyclical, according to Freud, the, the sex drive, the death drive, or the life drive and the death drive. Uh, the next thing we're going to talk about is psychosexual development, but I think it's time to take a look at questions and answers. How are we doing, Judy? Um, well, yeah, I think that's a good idea. It's, uh, we've got about 15 minutes left and we do have a couple of questions uh, in the Q&A column, uh, but I'll say to the audience, uh, we have room for more. So if you have a question about um, anything that JB has covered, uh, now's your chance to type it into the Q&A column and I will read it. And the first question is, isn't some compensation simply normal life? Are we bound, aren't we bound to be better at some things? Oh, I see, Compens overcompensation as a, as a defense mechanism. Aren't we bound to be better at some things than others? And I'm gonna broaden that a bit because I wonder so many of these defense mechanisms do just seem like the, the way we organize normal life. Uh, why do we have to pathologize it medically, uh, make it a medical condition? Yeah, 
uh, uh, we don't need to see these things as negatives. Mm -hmm. They help us get from one place to another. They help us survive life. These mm -hmm. are these are help, these are help things, and uh, we frequently see a lot of things in psychology as being very negative, and we need to find a cure. No, if we didn't have these things, what in the world would life be like? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, no, I my my position is. Uh, so we need to practice these things, but some of them are very negative mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. affect other people very horribly. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think those are the ones we really need to recognize. Uh, I think narcissism is one of these things that's very negative and belongs in the mental disorders category. The rest of them uh, are many, I mean, uh, many of the rest of them are really uh, positive ways to react to what life is giving us. Uh -huh. That brings up a question about narcissism and narcissistic, <clears throat> excuse me, attachment. And narcissistic attachment, if I understood correctly, was uh, what, what happens when one is de deprived of a love object, uh, untimely, too early, whatever. So the question is, are narcissists, are, are they born that way or are they made? We agree that narcissism is a bad thing, but can you prevent a narcissist from being? From, from being? <laughs> is there a way well, to prevent I, narcissism? I come down real heavy on the nurture side. We learn mm -hmm. these things. They aren't born into us. Um, other people say, no, there, there are people that have predispositions to mental disorders and, mm -hmm. and biological in nature. And, and uh, there are things that we consider to be uh, mental disorders and people can be given a prescription drug and they feel much better. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are, I, I mean, there are things like pills that people can take and they react better. Should those things be defined as uh, physical diseases? Mm -hmm. Although we treat them as mental diseases because that's kind of how they're displayed. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are, there are drug cures uh, for them. I, I have a great aunt who spent the last 30 years of her life in a Canadian mental institution. Mm -hmm. I have a nephew with the same disorder who's a functioning adult now in his 60s and uh, has never been institutionalized because he's got a pill he takes. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know. I, I yeah. guess uh, the, the debate goes both sides. I can see solutions in both areas, physical and mental, but um, I, I'm also an advocate of things are human with humans, things are learned. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I think here's another question uh, along the same lines. This person says, isn't the ability to laugh at oneself a sign of maturity? It's not always a defense mechanism. Yeah, there are people who see that as a negative. I think it's a very positive. It helps us deal. Um, mm -hmm. As I said, it's, it's a giant factor in my family. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I have a brother that should have been a comedian. <laughs> you mentioned... But, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. What, no, no. You mentioned in the lecture that, that Freud really didn't like jokes very much, that he, you know, sort of found a lot of uh, hidden psychological material in jokes. Is it possible he just didn't have a very good sense of humor? <laughs> sure. Yeah, I, and I don't know, you know, what his personal life was like, but uh, he was... Uh, in, in terms of joking and humor. And mm -hmm. he, he did at one time 
you know, he talked about smoking being sexual in nature. Uh, and somebody brought up to him the fact that he smoked cigars and he stated that sometimes a cigar is just a good cigar. Yeah, right. <clears throat> yeah. Um, I, I think we need some of these things. I also think it helps us to know that we're using them. Mm -hmm. I, I think, uh, you know, when I go through a, a list like we just did of uh, defense mechanisms and I go, oh, no, I'm doing that. <laughs> well, you just, realize, you, you just realized what you're doing. It doesn't mean that you have to stop doing that. Mm -hmm. it, it's aiding you in adjusting how harm ask yourself how harmful is that to somebody else mm -hmm. yeah um next question are people considered to have instincts in this day I, i'm not sure. quite sure okay uh, okay here they are there's uh, lots of people that think a great deal of what we do is instinctual uh i come down on the side of uh, we kind of think a lot of that because uh, it's a good excuse for, I didn't know it, it's built in. Mm -hmm. uh, at, at the same time, it's, uh, it's interesting how our legal structure has changed. In, in the 1800s, you were aware of everything you were doing. There was no unconscious, no concept of an unconscious mind or hiding mm -hmm. things. Consequently, punishments were based on, you knew all about it. Mm. Uh, then along came the big psychological movements of the uh, late 1800s and the first half of the 1900s. And uh, we started seeing people as... Uh, you know, there's first degree murder and second degree murder and third degree murder called manslaughter and there's different motives and some of them are hidden from people, some are mm -hmm. instantaneous, some are, some are thought about in advance. Um, I think these are all uh, indicators that uh, mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're largely learning animals. Yeah. Here's a question. I've just been waiting for this. If this person hadn't asked it, I would have asked it myself. How do you characterize Putin? What is the psychological mechanisms that work there? Uh, overcompensation? Does he have a death witch? What would you say about Putin? I don't. I, uh, uh, um, I would use the word power. Mm -hmm. And uh, it affects. Uh, it affects a tremendous amount of people that achieve it. Mm -hmm. It's the power. First, there's the hunger for it among many. I, I don't know. I've always said, you know, pe there's two things that uh, people tend to be. We're authoritarian and hierarchical, or it's not, it's, it's hierarchical and proximity. Mm-hmm. Proximity, I can understand. That was like that, that photo of Lyndon Johnson standing too close to somebody. You're invading people's space. The amount of space between two people varies from culture to culture. Yeah. But proximity as a human thing, I can understand. I can understand the need for distance. Hierarchy. Mm -hmm. Hierarchy, I just have little sympathy for. Mm -hmm. I, I just, why are we like that? Why have we had kings? Why have we had two class systems throughout most of history? Why has most of history been hierarchical in nature, not democratic in nature? And even yeah. within a democracy, it displays itself. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what Putin's doing, and I, I don't know that it's much different from a whole lot of other people in high places. 
Uh, it certainly, certainly is, but I mean, we, we see it. Mm -hmm. We see it in a lot of places. Yeah, yeah. So I, I don't know what, what to say about Putin. If mm -hmm. uh, he's invading a place that his country used to own. Now, let's see, has the United States invaded any place in the last hundred years? <laughs> I'm thinking Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan. I thought I'm you thinking, were joking. <laughs> well, no, I, I, uh, and I mean, of course we have. We, we, um, um, we want to keep them from having nuclear weapons because they might use them against us. But why didn't we invade England, France, India, China? Uh, so yeah, I just, uh, it, it's power at the top for a lot of people and they abuse it. Mm, okay. And, uh, that, uh, it's just something that we need to control. And um, that's, that's what checks and balances are about in the American mm -hmm. democracy. And even that's gotten out of control. 50 years ago, we started talking about the imperial presidency. Mm. And presidents no longer go to Congress to declare war. We haven't declared a war since 1941, and we've had many of them. Mm -hmm. So, no, so consequently, I don't know what to say. Well, we've got just a couple of minutes left and a number of questions. So I'd like to push through as many of these as possible. So let's just keep going. Um, is the narcissist the same as a sociopath? Uh, there are similarities, yes. Uh, okay. uh, sociopaths. Sociopaths like to hurt people and they frequently like to do it physically. Mm, all right. Um, are not defense mechanisms generally useful except in the extreme? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep, I think we talked about that and it's nice to know which ones you're using. Mm -hmm. What's the difference between uh, suppression and repression? You mentioned both of them. What's the difference between those two? Uh, suppression is more uh, unconscious. Uh, repression keeps coming back at you. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, we've got one minute left, and we've got a number of comments here, really, mostly about, um, about the situation in the Ukraine. Uh, Putin's war includes monstrous war crimes. Russia is an extremely hierarchical society, according to this person. Um, and then again, it, it, this is a manifestation of these traits. Uh, we see it in, as Russia invades the Ukraine. Um, and I think we talked about all that. So we are out of time. And um, I want to thank everyone very much. Thank you very much, JV. Uh, we'll be back next week. Uh, with part three, I think it is on the works of Freud, part four in our series. Um, so what what will we talk about next week on Freud? Uh, well, we're going to talk about his later life, his mm -hmm. death, and we'll talk about some of his cases mm -hmm. that he had. Mm -hmm. Okay, and maybe and something about some of his critics as well, because I know people have been asking about that as well. So we look forward to seeing you all uh, next week. Thank you very much. See you then. Bye-bye now.